look at Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 16 first, and then we'll go to Romans chapter, chapter number 1. And uh, I want us to go ahead and... Um, I'm going to read these from the King James Version, and for the remainder of the day, I'll probably stay in the, in the New International Version. So if you would, please stand to your feet as we do. It is our custom here to honor the ever-living Word of God. Romans chapter 8 <clears throat> and verse number 16. Let's read. The Spirit itself... All right, let's read like children of God. Come on. The Spirit itself... <laughs> <laughs> now, before we go to the next verse, what did you get out of that, that verse? The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God or the children of God. What did you get out of that? Do you know when I got out of that scripture? First of all, I have an inward witness, okay? And then it talked about two spirits. Put it back up there again. It says, come, come on, y'all, come on real quick. The Spirit... Bear witness with our spirit, or my spirit. Say two spirits. All right, let's look at the next verse in Romans chapter 9 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 9 and verse number 1. I say the truth in Christ. You all may be seated. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So in the first verse, it said that the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit, or my spirit, that we are the sons of God. And then Paul says, I lie not. He says, my conscience bearing me witness. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight, you can go ahead and put my title up. I want to talk about conscience, the, the inner, the voice of the inner witness. Conscience, the voice of the inner witness. There are three voices, and, and you all have heard me teach this before, but for those of you that haven't, that every, a few voices that you need to be... Um, um, concerned about. There's the voice of God that you need to be concerned about, but then there's other voices that emanate from you, spirit, soul, and body. Every component that we have, it has a voice. If I were to come up to you and cut you physically, that would cause pain. That is the voice of your flesh. Um, well, what is the voice of my soul, the voice of your soul? Those are your thoughts, your will, your emotions, your intellect, your imagination. You articulate those through a voice, and that is your thoughts, okay? Well, then what is the voice of my born-again spirit? The voice of my born-again spirit is something that's called my conscience. Now, you can only trust the voice of your conscience if you're born again. Because if you're born again, you have a born-again spirit that lives on the inside of you. And Paul just told you that his conscience, it is the voice, and the spirit bears witness with my spirit. Conscience, is a, conscience is, a, is, is a funny thing. Conscience is a is a weird kind of funny thing because uh, conscience will make you get up and walk the floor at 2 or 3 o'clock in the night. Conscience won't let you sleep. Um, you, can't, you can't make conscience be quiet. You can't drink enough Henny. You can't drink enough Tito's. You can't drink enough Chirac. You can't drink enough Naughty Head. You can't drink enough Mad Dog. Somebody said, Pastor, stop naming them. Stop naming them. You're naming too many. I'm naming, y'all should have said, whoa, Pastor, you're naming it a little bit too easy, all right? <laughs> you, you can't shoot up enough. You can't snort enough. You can't sniff enough. You can't lay in a person's arm enough to make conscience shut up. Conscience will make you turn around and go back and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> conscience will make you pick up the phone late at night and call somebody that wasn't even expecting to hear from you. Conscience will make you do some things. Conscience will make you go in and against all pride and against all odds, tell your wife, baby, I'm sorry, you were right. That's what conscience will do, all right? <laughs> so we're talking about conscience, the voice of the inner witness. Um, most of you that drive modern automobiles, I know that when, when I get into my automobile, I remember one car, um, I got it, I had, I had a brand new car and I took it through the car wash and all these lights. Whistle. I almost wrecked the car in the car wash because I didn't know what the lights meant. How many of you, when you turn on your car in the morning, before the ignition really engages, there's a series of lights all over the dashboard, all of those lights, okay? Now, all of those lights are running a system check on your vehicle to make sure that all the systems are functioning properly. Now, if one of those lights remains on, that's an indicator. <laughs> 
that, that's an indicator that, that, that something is wrong. So you have to understand that your convictions sit at the feet of your conscience. You're going to understand that later. Your convictions sit at the feet of your conscience. Your conscience will determine your convictions. And so if one of those lights comes on, it is not the responsibility of the car to drive itself to the shop. Y'all saw the news this week with the Teslas, with the, the come get me feature on the, I call it the come get me feature, where you just press the button, the car just, just pulls out by itself and just come, the car was running over people and running in the walls and all kinds of stuff. I don't know why I thought about that, but I thought about that. But anyway, and so you understand that I have to take that car to the shop and then get that thing fixed. And so remember, conviction sits at the seat of comes on. This is what I love about God and being born again. You can't lie to a couple of folk. You can't lie to God, and you cannot lie to your conscience. Who was that? Who was the writer that said, to thine own self? Who was that? Who was it? Socrates? All right, one of them, Socrates. All right, to thine own self be true. And so you can't run away from these voices, okay? Now, when you talk about this guy, Apostle Paul, have you ever thought about the revelations? We know he could hear from God. He had to hear from God. Have you ever thought about the revelations? Notice the word that I used, the, not information, but the revelations that he received without a King James, without an NIV, without a New American Standard, without today's living Bible. As a matter of fact, he said he received direct downloads straight from God. Man, was amazing. Have you ever looked at, look, look, look at this. I want to just run through a couple of these. Look at the revelation he received on faith in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Y'all get ready to roll with me back in the back. Look at this. Romans uh, chapter 3 and verse 28. Y'all get ready to roll with me back in the back. Okay. Let me go back over here again. Romans chapter 3. All right. Okay. <laughs> It says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. What a huge revelation. No Bible, no nothing. Y'all don't understand how powerful this is. These people lived and died by the law, 613 ordinances and sacrifices, and none of those made them righteous. And here this man is, no Bible, no text, nothing. He says, but I perceive, y'all got to help me now. He says, but I perceive that a person is justified by what? By faith. And by works of the law. Let me show you another revelation he received. Straight down low from heaven. A revelation of righteous, righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Man, this thing set me free. He made him who knew no sin. I can repeat it quicker than they can get it up there. God made him who, knew, who had no sin to be sin for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's Y'all don't understand that. You see, that goes way back to when people bought sacrifices. You put one hand on the sacrifice that was about to be killed, another hand on the person. While this person is confessing their sins, the animal is killed. And so what the Bible is trying to tell us when Jesus hung on that cross, do you know every sin that you will ever commit, past, present, or future, has already been dealt with? Now, maybe that may not set you free. Oh, man, but that sets me free. And I don't know about you, but some days I wake up and I do not feel righteous. Some days when I'm driving, my behavior is not righteous. Sometimes when I sit down and I just have some of these crazy thoughts that I have, they are not righteous. But there is an overruling word that rests in my spirit that says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for me, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And see, that frees me up because I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I've told you time and time again, never let the voice of a critic become louder than your creator. And my creator says that I'm righteous. Therefore, there is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, this guy was picking up these revelations and didn't even have a Bible. You've got a concordance. You've got a Bible. You've got a and you still can't get it. Me either. <laughs> Look at another one. Look at the revelation of grace. For by grace... Are you saved through faith, and that not of works, lest any man should boast? That will set you free. If you listen to your conscience, that'll set you free too. But he's getting all of these. They say you sleep better with a clean house. Same thing goes for a heart. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. Can I borrow something from, from Pastor Blow? <laughs> they say you sleep better with a clean house. 
you also sleep better with a, a clean heart. But he says, for I got interrupted by something out there. His revelation of grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me tell you why that's liberating. Because I grew up in a system of religion that was legalistic. And we thought somehow that if we lived right, if we did right, if we thought right, we were earning favor with God. We even incorporated, incorporated that faulty theology into our songs. Lord, I'm running, trying to make a hundred, 99 and a half won't do. What my Bible tells me is that somebody has already run my race. And not only did they run it, they won it, all right? And if I put my faith in him, it's not about what I do, but it's about what he's already done. And so because I believe that, I am saved by grace through my faith in him. I don't have to work my way up. I don't have to sing my way up. I don't have to serve my way up. I don't have to pray my way up. I don't have to give my way up. I'm already up. He has made me to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus with no effort on my part. That's why I praise him. That's why I sing. That's why I shout. He did for you and I what we could not do for ourselves. He paid a debt that justice demanded. Abraham couldn't pay it. Isaac couldn't pay it. David couldn't pay it. Elijah couldn't pay it. Paul couldn't pay it. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, paid the debt. See, now you say, well, why are you so excited about that? Because it's revelation and not information. Information will cause you just to sit there in church unbothered. But revelation, when you know you were lost, but now you're found. When you knew you were blind, but now you see. When you knew you didn't have enough sense to deliver yourself or keep yourself. When you realize there was somebody watching over you and kept, oh, Jesus. When you realize what the Lord has done for us, this when you say, the Lord has done great things. And I'm glad. <laughs> Maybe you're not glad about it. But there's some folk not glad that you saved. There's some folk not glad that the Lord's keeping you. There's some folk that are not glad that the Lord is blessing you. There are some folk not glad that he is sustaining you. But I came to tell you, he is going to keep you. He is going to take care of you. He is going to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Amen. Amen. Now, let me show you this because you said, you mean this man got all of this stuff with no Bible? Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 2. I'm at 1 and 12. I'm going to show you how in just a minute. Galatians 1 and 12. Look at what he said. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. That's what I mean by, by conviction, the voice of your conscience. See, some things nobody knows you and God talking about but you. Okay? And so you receive that directly from the Holy Ghost. But here's the thing. Will you yield to your conscience or will you keep going? Because the Bible talks about those who have had their conscience seared with a hot iron. And that's for those who once felt but no longer feel. <laughs> that's for folk who once felt but no longer feel. You lost your husband in a divorce to another woman that you knew. You know what that felt like. But now here you are seeing somebody else's husband. Y'all miss what I just said, right? You forgot the way it felt and now you're doing the same thing that was done to you, but you have allowed that situation to make you bitter and your conscience has become seared. And now you don't see that the same thing that brought pain and heartache into your life, you are doing the same thing because you allowed a situation to make you bitter instead of better. Can I tell you something? When you say... God is intentional, and he's doing all things for my good. Sometimes God takes people out of your life, even ones you married, because he didn't put you together in the first place. The Bible says what the Lord has joined together. You can't convince me that some of these folk, God didn't have nothing to do with that. I know I'm going to catch some flat, but y'all know I ain't never been scared. Never. God doesn't join two men together. God doesn't join two women together. 
You can walk around here and dress it up all you want to and say whatever words you want to do. God is not the author of confusion. <laughs> and listen, he's not going to change what he said just because you disagree with it. He's not going to change what he said just because you have a problem with it. Oh, man. I'll be a man, but... Okay, now, let's talk about this. Now, as you begin and you begin to study the Word of God, it begins to lay a foundation for righteousness in your life. I want to show you something. Psalms chapter 119, 105, and I'm showing you how your conscience is reshaped because the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as I begin to read the, God, read the Word of God, the Word of God becomes a standard for all of my conduct. Now, if, if you haven't read it, then you, you kind of don't understand what I'm saying, but the Word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Lord, order my steps in your and let no iniquity have dominion over me. So as I begin to read the Word of God, the Word of God begins to shine light on my ways. And it shows me whether my ways are right or wrong. And the more I read, the more the Word of God becomes a framework or establishes parameters for my conscience to walk in. And when my conscience violates the parameters that I've studied and hidden in my heart, that's why the psalmist says, Thy word, O Lord, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I don't have to have a Bible in my hand to know when I violated it. <laughs> so you're trying to keep a whole bunch of commandments, but really all you have to do is keep two. A guy came to Jesus one time and asked him, said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus told him plain. He said, uh, said, the first one is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And he said, the second one is like unto the other. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit acts like a sheriff. And so, see, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so when you violate the law that has been established in your heart, in your conscience, in your spirit, the Holy Ghost reels you, I'm sorry, conscience reels you back in and lets you know you're out of bounds. Isn't it funny how you can say some stuff to people and you know you meant harm when you said it and you try to walk away thinking it's cute. <laughs> Is there anybody like me who posts on Facebook all the time and the Holy Ghost makes you pull it? Y'all never had that experience where you post something and con conscience gets you? You try, because you're mad when you first post it, right? And you're and you walking away and conscience start talking to you. And then you run back and hope nobody's read and you just pull it. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. Why? Because our soul is working one way. Our flesh is thinking another way. Our spirit is thinking totally different. And the spirit will allow you to do some things, but conscience will come back and get you. That's why I said conscience will wake you up. Can we get real and talk about how conscience works? Because when you're born again, it never leaves you. It just stays with you all the time. How many of you remember back in the day when you wanted to do some dirt? And it was dirt that you didn't want nobody to do, but you just had to have. You ever had dirt and some desire build up for a week? Like it's been building up Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday is supposed to be the big day. Okay? <laughs> all right. And it's just a whole lot of flesh and whatnot. So Friday, Friday night happens. And after Friday night happens, as soon as the flesh is satisfied, conscience shows up. And then when conscience shows up, it's really crazy because you want to leave, but conscience says, you can't do that. You're not that kind of dog. You, hear, oh, <laughs> you can hear mosquito light on cotton out there got so quiet. Y'all know it. <laughs> So conscience says, I'm not supposed, it's funny how conscience shows up right after flesh is satisfied. Conscience shows up blasting, making noise, all right? And so now you have a choice. I mean, I, I got to go. What you mean you got to go? Conscience. <laughs> That's real world, all right? I'm just telling you. That's what conscience will do. When you're disrespectful to someone that you should not be disrespectful to conscience will make you go back and apologize. Conscience doesn't care if anybody sees you make it right. Did you hear what I just said? See, some people do stuff because they want everybody to see. Conscience doesn't care about what other people see. The only thing that conscience 
wants to see it do what it does. He only wants God to see what it does. That's all conscience cares about. Okay. And you can't run away from it. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and talk about something else. Psalms 119, 105. Let's go ahead and put this in here. Okay. Psalms 119 and 105. How many of you read your Bible? Okay. Now, now, look at what it says. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto our pathway. Light unto my path. Okay. Progressive revelation. Progr what do you mean, Pastor, progressive revelation? They didn't have ever-ready flashlights back then. The writer that wrote this spoke from his culture and his surroundings. They walked with lamps on a path. And most of you have no idea what paths are. In the rural area where I grew up, sometimes in order to get to someone else's house, we didn't go down the street. The shortcut was through the woods. And we went back and forth through the woods so much that our feet wore down a narrow pathway. Now, the pathway was pretty easy to follow during the day, but you dare not go out there at night because you had no light. What the writer was saying is, with this lamp that the Word of God has given me, I may not know everything, but it provides me just enough to see where my next step ought to be. See, see, you look, you're looking way over there into 2020. Sometimes just take one step at a time. And sometimes you have to be thankful for that one step at a time, you see? And so as I begin to digest the Word of God, it becomes a lamp and a light. It begins to expose things. And when it begins to expose things, the conscience, my conscience comes along and confirms what God is saying. Sometimes you can do something that's right and it becomes unrighteous if your conscience says, <laughs> yeah, see, you can tell the truth. You can be saying the truth, but you didn't. It wasn't for you to tell. And where your truth, what, not your truth. Be careful of people that's talking about your truth because it's not your truth, my truth. There's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So I want to hear your truth because your truth is faulty. Just give me his truth, okay? Now, I don't know why, but that got me all, all off my thing about revelation. Where, what was I talking about before that? Huh? The lamp. Progressive revelation, all right? All right, so now if God shines a light on something that I did, and I did it a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, should I act like, okay, you did something, you didn't know it was in the Word, but the Word of God shows you now that when you did that, you violated the law of love. Now, this was a month ago. Conscience will say, go back and make it right. Your spirit will say this, well, they forgot about it. God looks at little things. God looks at how quickly you are willing to make small adjustments. Because small adjustments can produce huge outcomes. How many golfers do we have in here? I'm not talking about hackers. I mean, I saw Kevin raise his hand. I, 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 I didn't ask for hackers. I said golfers. <laughs> All, <laughs> that's one of my golf buddies. All of us are hackers. All right. But when we play golf, we have this thing that's called, now everybody doesn't give it to you. It's called a mulligan. Okay. <laughs> I've got past Deborah plays too. So if I hit my first ball out of bounds, I can say I want to use my mulligan. Okay, now when I set up my mulligan, I can make a small adjustment based upon what I know I did wrong to cause the ball to go that way. And a person that doesn't understand golf will never know the adjustment that I made. My stance may have been closed. I may need to open it. I may need to wing this left foot out so I can get through the ball. You don't see all of that. But when I hit the ball, you see a huge difference. What I'm trying to tell you is, is God will ask you to make incremental adjustments and in little things that you may think mean nothing. But yet and still, it is your willingness to make the adjustment. And here's the thing. If you don't make the adjustment, you can't make conscious. Be quiet. He'll keep talking to you and talking. Do you know when Christians ought to be worried? When conscience gets quiet. Every Christian, when conscience gets quiet, it's time to fast and to pray. Go to the prayer tent because something is wrong. Do you all remember King Saul? Do you all remember him? And do you remember the Bible says that there came a time when God stopped talking to him? He understood the significance of God not talking to him, and it put him in a panic mode. And he messed around with some witches and whatnot and, and called up Saul, and Saul told him exactly what was going to happen. Amen? All right, let me share something else with you about your conscience. Mm. It's Psalms, 19, one, Psalms 119 and 11. There is a mother, 
um, that's in here now. If you want me to pray for you, if you come up, when I say this, I'll pray for you. It's not anybody's business. Don't worry about all the people that are here. But your conscience has been telling you to go back and undo something that involved your daughter, that broke your daughter's heart. And for stubbornness and for pride, you haven't gone back and corrected that situation. But every day, including this morning, and normally it speaks to you in the morning, it'll come to you in a thought, call your daughter, call your daughter, but you don't. Okay, now, um, like I said before, if you want prayer, I'll pray for you. Don't worry about all these folks. God's not concerned about them. He wouldn't have told me that unless there's something on the other side of that. Go ahead and come on up. How you doing? I bet you didn't plan on coming up here when you came to church this Sunday. In the Old Testament, <laughs> in the Old Testament, I believe it was the blood of a bull. They would kill a bull, and they would take the blood of the bull, and they would anoint the right ear. Come up here, Deborah. They would anoint the right ear of the priest. The reason that they would anoint the right ear of the priest is because it was signifying that their hearing was going to be different. I need you to look at me because I don't know if you heard what I just said. God is anointing the ear of your heart to hear him better. Okay? And it's, it's not so much that you don't hear, you have a problem obeying sometimes. But this is not so much about what's happening with, with you and your daughter. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what's going to happen afterwards. Because this is a test for you and God thought so much of you that he interrupted my message to have me deal with you about this particular thing because there's going to be something awesome on the other side. Listen. I want you to hear me. Just lay your pride down. If you were wrong, say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. You would be amazed at how those words will cause God to run and jump to your rescue. He gives grace to the humble, but he resisteth the proud. But I'm here to tell you God has some great things. And listen, it's only a test. And guess what? You're going to pass. You're going to do what's right in Jesus' name. Thank you. Now, let, let me share something with y'all. Y'all have no idea how much God loves you. He, out of all of the people that are in this building, he knows every individual thing that you are wrestling with and that you are struggling with. He may not have called you out, but trust me when I tell you, he is intimately concerned with even the smallest details of your life. You say, well, Pastor, I know I'm segueing. You say, well, Pastor, how do you know? Jesus said a sparrow doesn't even fall to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing about it. He said, if God is concerned about sparrows, he said, don't you think he's concerned about you? Yeah. So rest today because you've been, I hear you, I hear you. You've been asking God how long and you've been asking God why. I told you he's intentional. What he has allowed to come into your life, he allowed it to come in with a purpose and a plan. Even your Judases have a purpose. Jesus couldn't get to the cross without a Judas. Even your, he'll make it all work together. All right, let me get back to my message. Hallelujah. All right, let's take, let, let, let's take a look, look at something else. All right, Psalms, we did 119 and 11, didn't we? Did we? Put it up there, let me see, I'll tell you. Okay, now, I have hidden your word, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, what does that do? All right, I've got a walking gauge. I've got a walking barometer. I've got a walking measuring stick on the inside of my heart because I've hidden the Word of God in my heart. Do you know how you hide the Word of God in your heart? You can't just read it and, oh, I read a verse, I read a book, and I'm gone. No. One of the things I do in the morning when I'm walking is I'll have my headphones in and I just listen to the Word of God. The thing that God has been, been dealing with me now and, and talking with me about is Ephesians and just revelation and the depth of his revelation and, and who we are in him. And see, when you keep listening to the same thing over and over, believe it or not, even when you don't know it, it gets in your spirit. And when it gets in your spirit, remember, the conscience is the seat of your convictions. So when I get out of the way, conscience steps in and convicts me because I have violated the principle of God's word. 
See, if we all did one thing, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If, you, if we could follow that one simple rule, all the ills of the world would be solved. But again, it is a matter of conscience. I don't see how some people sleep at night. I don't want to get political, but I don't see how any politicians sleep at night. How can you sleep? How do you go to sleep? I can't, I can't do folk wrong on purpose. I, I remember one. I did something to somebody when I was in the Air Force because they had done me wrong. And, uh, and it's weird. Um, I, I did it out of malice. And the, and the person really hadn't done anything wrong. I just did it out of malice. And I called um, the MPs and told them that this person was off base and they were restricted to base. And they got in trouble for it about 30, 30, 37, 40 something years ago, okay? And uh, my conscience got me. And I had to go back to that same person with tears in my eyes, and I thank God that he was able to receive what I was saying. And I had to go back. I don't even know if he knew what I did. You y'all don't understand. Conscience doesn't care about getting caught. I'm gonna say it again. Conscience does not care about getting caught because getting caught is not the important thing. The important thing with conscience is to please God. That's why Paul says, my conscience bearing me witness. They don't have to know that you did it for you to go back and tell them you're sorry. You know what you did. You know what you said. You threw a rock and you hid your hand. And then you have the audacity to stand in their face and smile like everything is all right. You're two-faced talking out the side of your neck. Apologize and go back. Get your heart right with God. Go and talk to God and say, God, create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Let my words be few and seasoned with salt. Look people in the eye. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't scratch where you don't itch. And you'll never have a problem with your conscience. If you ask me if I like you and I don't like you, I will look you square in the face. And not only will I tell you I don't like you, I'll tell you why. But we... <laughs> But then that way we have an understanding. We have an understanding. I don't like you, you don't like me. But we love each other in Christ. <laughs> you, say, you say, Pastor, where they do that at? <laughs> we do it all the time. Have you all ever heard somebody, had somebody greet you like this, I love you in the Lord? You, see, you don't understand what they're saying when they said, I love you in the Lord. What they're really saying is, I can't stand you. <laughs> I really don't like nothing about you. But I'm commanded to love you, so I love you in the Lord. So don't ever tell me you love me in the Lord. All right? Don't tell me that. <laughs> all right. Now let's look at a couple of things, though. Uh, and I'm a, I don't want to keep you guys too long. Look at Psalms 19 and 13. David talked about something that was very serious. He talked about presumptuous sin. <laughs> let's flip this one. Well, let's, let's do this one first, and we'll flip it to the NIV. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, then I will be blameless, innocent of the great transgression. Let's look at that in the, in the King James for a moment. He says... Um, Keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. What is a presumptuous sin? There's some things you can't stumble and do. Some kind of stuff you can be walking, you can stumble and you can fall. Some stuff you can't stumble and do it. It has to be planned intentionally. He planned to have Uriah killed. He planned to sleep with Bathsheba. He, he, he knew what he was going to do before he did it. Presumptuous sins. Now, we all sitting out there and just looking all straight and whatnot, but this is where conscience comes into play. How many of you have been getting ready to sin? And the Holy Ghost said, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Have you ever been waiting on a parking spot? During th Watch what's going to happen. Thanksgiving and Christmas, watch. <laughs> it's supposed to be the happiest time of the year, but be careful. People ride around looking, I told y'all, people ride around looking for parking lots, and, and y'all can be tested on this. And you followed the person out the door and drove right behind them to the spot, and you're sitting there with the blinker on. Everybody in the world knows this is their parking spot. And some little dude swings around the corner, 
And because of the way the car backed out, he pulled in first. Now, what you going to do <laughs> when the Hulk runs wild on you? What you going to do? <laughs> All right. Because years ago on Hiawassee Drive, there used to be, I think it was a Kmart or a Walmart Publix or somewhere up there, and my sister was here for Christmas, and we were cooking. You know how you're cooking for Christmas dinner, and you think you got all your stuff, and then you realize you got to go back out to the store? So you're already frustrated because now it's going to set back your, 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 your cook time when stuff gets ready. So I'm going to the store. I had my sister with me, and, uh, and I'm waiting. I just want to go in the store and get this one thing <laughs> and just come back out. And, and I was that guy. <laughs> they were circling, waiting on that spot. I was also that guy that got out of the car. And, uh, and this is what Conscience did. It was about a week later when Conscience came back. We were just starting television. And, and Conscience said to me, what if that lady and her son, because she had a little son, he was 18, he tried to rise up, but I was going to body slam him. <laughs> I had already thought my moves out. I knew what I was going to do. So she's pulling him back. <laughs> Y'all never thought about how you're going to knock somebody out? And the uh, Spirit of God says, says, now what if she came to your church, preacher, and you're preaching on Sunday after you just showed out like you didn't know the Holy Ghost at all out in public in a parking lot, in a public's parking lot. See, conscience a real... Now, I don't know if this lady is watching today, but ma'am, that was years ago. <laughs> I apologize to you and your son. He's probably a grown man now, but I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> That's what comes to make you do. All right. When you violate conscience, let me, show you, let me show you what happens. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 29. When you violate conscience, conscience will let you know about adjustments you need to make that will release the favor of God in your life because he'll cut it off if you don't listen to, if you don't listen to conscience. Okay. Now, here, here you have Jeremiah and, um, and the people are running back and forth and they're worshiping idol gods and they're wondering... This is so crazy. Human rights violations, idolatry, and everything else, and they're wondering why the covenant blessings of God are no longer showing up in their lives. They understood covenant, and they understood the power of covenant. So when Jesus said to them, when, when he said, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, all these things do the Gentiles worry about. What he was saying is, is I don't have a covenant relationship with them. But with you, I'm your heavenly father, and I know how to give good gifts to my children so you don't have to worry about it because covenant came into play. Now, these are covenant people, and they understood that a part of the covenant was the covenant blessing, and the covenant blessing wasn't happening anymore. And this is what God says. He says, your wrongdoings have kept these away. Your sins have deprived you of good. See, conscience will let you know when you make an like the lights. Conscience will let you know when you need to make an adjustment, but it won't make the adjustment for you. You have to make the adjustment yourself. And I told you, whenever you read the Word of God and you see the promises of God and the blessings of God, whenever you don't see those things showing up in your life, do not look at God. Go back and look at yourself. During one of the worst times of my life, I was so angry with God. House was in foreclosure. Everything was falling apart. I called myself walking around the house, shaking my fist at God and telling God how mad I was at him. And he just said this. He said, and having done all to stand. I said, what? <laughs> and he said, and having done all. He didn't say to stand. He just said, and having done all. And then he told me this. He said, look at your current situation. He said, is it my fault or is it yours? And when I sat down and I got quiet, God had nothing to do with my problems. Each and every one I had created. And conscience came and talked to me about that, and I apologized to God. I don't blame God for nothing anymore because God is always right, you see. But if you don't listen to conscience, you'll try to override, people will try to override conscience and blame you for the hurt that they feel. Some people, do you know what I found out? Some people don't want forgiveness. You listen, they, don't want, they, they like playing the victim too much. It, it's, it's being the victim that causes, they need attention. And so they, they don't want the situation to be healed. They just want, oh, they did this to me. And, and oh, they did. why are you giving that person that kind of power? Conscience is not telling you anything. See, conscience works a couple of ways. Conscience sometimes tells me when a person wants attention or when they actually need assistance. And everybody doesn't want assistance. Some people want attention. Amen. 
Let me see if I have anything else to talk to you all about today. All right. Now, let's look at this, and we are going home. It's the voice of conscience that brings us to a place of introspection. Now, look at, we're going to go through four scriptures. Yeah, four, and then we're going to be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28. How many of you, your conscience talks to you all the time? All the time. Sometimes your conscience rides in the car with you. She, she caught it real quick. Sometimes you want to tell your conscience, shut up. Sometimes your conscience will tell you how to drive. All the married brothers that know what I'm talking about, that you ain't scared, raise your hand. My man didn't move his hand. He kept that hand right there. All right? He didn't raise that hand more. All right? No, because sometimes God allows conscience to echo. And the, e and the echo can be your wife or someone close to you. Now, they're not saying anything that you haven't already heard. But you just don't want them to reinforce it. I tell Deborah all the time, I have taken you everywhere you ever wanted to go in your life. You don't drive nowhere. I ain't never killed you. <laughs> so trust my driving. Even though what she's telling me is exactly right, and I know what she's telling me is right, but it's conscience and pride that are bumping head, conscious saying she's right, pride says, don't tell her, just keep on driving like you're driving. <laughs> and then you get a ticket. <laughs> all right, let's look at these. 1 Corinthians 11 and 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat and drink of this cup. I just wanted to show you that everyone ought to examine themselves. Every night when your head hits the pillow, go back and do inventory. Yeah. Trust me, that is a good practice to have. As a matter of fact, if you messed up real bad, you're not going to go to sleep because conscience will not let you sleep. And even if you try to doze off, it's going to wake you up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Conscience is like, not, not. Who is it? Conscience. <laughs> All right. So we have to examine ourselves. And then sometimes you have to be careful when you examine yourself. Do you know why? The writer in Proverbs says that uh, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah says, who tries the reins of men's heart? God does. So you have to be very careful when you, try your, when you examine yourself because pride will make you say, self, you were right and they were wrong. All right, let's get to the next verse. Uh, Romans 8. Uh, it should be Romans. Yeah, there you go. Romans 8, 27. And he who searches our hearts. Wow. You can lie against. You, listen, you can fool everybody. But he who searches our hearts. When God was looking for a king and he went to Jesse's house and they paraded all of those boys in there. And I think it was Eliab who was the tallest. Back then, if you, if you remember, do you remember when King Saul was chosen, the Bible said he stood head and shoulders above everybody else? When you were tall back in those days, you were considered to be favored of the Lord. So when Eliab walks in, the prophet puts his eyes on him, and he arises to anoint him. God says, wait, wait, wait. He says, you've misjudged this entire situation. He said, you're looking on this boy's physical characteristics. He said, I'm looking somewhere else. They didn't even call David. That's how, that's how little they thought of David. David comes in dusty, stink, smelling like sheep. God says, that one. Why? Because I looked somewhere that you didn't look. You see, I was telling a young pastor this the other day. You want to go a long way with God? Have a right heart. Be quick to repent. Stay away from malicious gossip. If you do something wrong, if God tells you to straighten it, straighten it quick. He will always bless people who have a heart that's right before him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong in those whose hearts are perfect towards him. Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. The limitation is, but it is according to what's working in in you. You missed that. What's working in you? Is iniquity working in you? Is gossip working in you? Is devilment working in you? Is fraud and lying working in you? Pastor, what do you mean is it working in me? You never, you never premeditated a lie? Yeah, you did. You remember when you weren't sick and you were late? 
and they had already told you if you come in late one more time, you're going to be terminated? That was a presumptuous sin. You got up and stood in front of the mirror and rehearsed that before you made that call because your voice had to be just right. And then you, could, you had to get into character, and then you dialed the number. Hello. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I'm done. My, my voice is gone. I got a fever of 120. presumptuous sin see and so you, all right let's go to my next verse now watch this watch, watch how I catch you about conscience how many of y'all have done that before some of you can't raise your hand because your boss goes to church here but it's all right okay all right now first uh, John 321 this is what when my conscience doesn't bother me I have a saying that I live by Make sure your hands are clean. No matter who I deal with, no matter what the situation, at the end of the day, when you lay your head on the pillow, make sure that your hands are clean because God will honor those with clean hands. Paul said, I didn't defraud anybody. I didn't lie on anybody. I didn't try to use the word in a way to manipulate you. He said, my hands are clean. All right, now, dear friends, if your heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. When I hit the bed at night, my thing is, I don't want to have aught against anybody. And I don't want to have, I don't want anybody else to have aught with me. This even goes on a greater personal level because you know what the Bible says to husbands and wives? Let not the sun go down on your wrath. How would you feel? If the person that you've been married to 20, 30, 10, 15 years, if there were some things in your heart that you know you should have said, but rather you allowed a stupid argument to get in between you to the point that you went to one room and they stayed in the other room, how would you feel if you woke up that next morning and went in there and shook them and they didn't wake up? How would you feel if when you touched their body, their body was cold? Then tears would begin to fill your eyes and remorse and you would begin to grieve. But while they were there and conscience told you Go make that right. You overrode conscience. This is what I'm saying. Do y'all know that all of us are here today? There's no, there's no guarantee that we're going to make it until tomorrow, until the end of the day. And so there's some stuff that we ought to make right now because conscience is telling you to make it right.